What's happening, big dogs? Back to you again this week. Main film in theaters, starring yours truly and Noah. Back to the old squad. Nick not on this week. Uh, I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing what he's doing. So he's busy my watching the uh, Vikings, Chicago Bears, an absolute bloodbath. It's at halftime right now, and what we've seen so far is it's Kirk Cousins on Monday night. It's vintage Kirk. Yeah, he's uh he's watching he's watching team stink. And speaking of stinking, we're gonna get into all the week's games. Uh, this week slate, honestly, it was a pretty bad week. I mean, uh, scores were bad. I had a team, I had a super flex team this week that put up fifty five points. <laughs> Mike, 55. in the, in the what a do league, you like benched everybody, and I put up like eighty. I'm like, am I gonna? Be <laughs> <laughs> <No people." laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to bench everybody because we're going to war with Scott in that one. But uh, yeah, it was it was a shitty week. But before we get into everything, man, first. Let's talk about Noah's facial hair. He's got, I don't know what that is, like a forming mustache plus a half-grown beard. We're just and trying got, to – I shaved it today. Try to, like, give it a little yeah. form. I know you guys aren't going to like it, but it's it's whatever. He's got longer locks than, than my girlfriend, so it's kind of weird to see. Especially you guys missed it because he tied it up in his man bun, but he had he had free-flowing hair before the episode came on. But let's talk about that a little bit, man. Are you going to cut your hair at all uh, this season, or are you just going to, like, let it, let it flow? I'm going to have to eventually. The hairline's – it's, it's not good. Like <laughs> people say I have like a big forehead, which I kind of have a big forehead, but like the actual <laughs> lineup of my hair just isn't there right now. So I got to get that fixed up, but I don't know. I kind of like it long. Eventually, like when I get a real job, shit's going to have to change, but we'll see. Maybe, so maybe the working like, world's different. Whenever I get like a little bit long hair, like it starts itching the side of my face and like, Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. I, so much. it was, well, I didn't get a haircut for a while because of COVID. And then I'm like, you know what? We're just going to have to ride it out, I guess. And it was the worst. Like, I think it's been about a year now since I cut it. And from months like two to five, it was terrible. I, I hated every second <laughs> of it. But we're here now. We made it past the beginning. We pushed through. Nice, nice. All right. That's enough about hairdos. Let's jump into it, man. Before we get it, hit that intro. <laughs> All right, so this week, let's go through the games. I mean, I talked to you a little about a little bit. Like, my teams that scored, like, really bad, they aren't bad teams. Like, one of them is the undefeated team that I tweeted about with, like, it's just that Patrick Mahomes and everyone's on fucking buy. So, I didn't have them. But, like, man, this is a weird, weird week of scoring. All right, let's just go and do the same thing. I'm not going to spend too much time on every game. Just kind of hit on the games that matter. Uh, let's start off. First game, Texans-Browns fucking stinks everywhere, dude. Everywhere stinks. Except what is up with Cleveland? Are they, like, notorious for terrible weather? Because this is the second time this year there was, like, a pseudo-tornado and just completely took out the value of everybody except for Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt because they look great. But the passing yeah. game just, like, it couldn't work. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a – it's always brutal weather out there in the freaking dog pound. But, uh, I mean, the lone, lone bright spots here are Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt. So glad to have Nick Chubb back. Went 19 totes, 126 carries, one touchdown. Actually broke another touchdown, but he was smart enough to step out of the bounds and basically seal the game and not pull a Todd Gurley where they basically lost that game. after Todd what, do you, what do you think touchdown. of that, though? Because it would have been 17-7 with, like, what, 50 seconds left? Like, they wouldn't have probably – well, the, the, the yeah, Browns no, probably would have lost, but, like, I don't know. But that's exactly what happened with the Falcons, remember? Like, they were – uh, Yeah, were, but it like, would have been a two-score game, right? They couldn't have tied it. Uh, It was a two-score – oh, yeah, that's true. That's true, I guess. But I don't know, man. But, like, you never know what's going to happen, you know? Like, what if what if they punt it off, they return it back for a kick for a freaking touchdown, and then, like, next time they drive it down onto that kick? Like, you know, just, there's no chance – no chance to take that. No point. So Nick Chubb made the smart play for his team, the dumb play for my fucking fantasy teams because robbed us of six points. God damn it. But he looked incredible, looked like a top three running back that he is. Kareem Hunt also looked great. I mean, this this Browns offense is basically just, just running, r- ground and pound. I mean, they had 41 total totes. Baker Mayfield had one tote. That doesn't even count, so I guess 38 uh, total carries between Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb, and they both look, they both look fantastic. Both I tweeted him, Mike. Nobody was more wrong about anything this offseason than the one take about Kareem Hunt being like the RB27. They're like, well, if Nick Chubb goes down, he's a top five running back. In fact, he's better <laughs> when Nick Chubb is playing. So the one easy cop-out take that you could have for Kareem Hunt being a sleeper, underpriced, wasn't even what brought him fantasy relevance. Because it <laughs> yeah. just seems like when Nick Chubb is out there, the guy runs for 100 yards. And he, not that he looks better than Nick Chubb, but he like basically – provides equal value minus probably the touchdown upside because the goal line work for Nick Chubb. And obviously we saw the breakaway, what would have been a touchdown, which would have cemented himself as like the number one RB on the week. So um, pending Monday night football, but it looks like Dalvin Cook isn't doing too much because Akeem Hicks just keeps screaming in his face. But uh, yeah, he's, 
this running game is incredible. This passing game, obviously the weather wasn't there for either side of the ball, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think the Browns are ever going to have to reel back and throw it 20, 25 times a game. And that's a super low number. But when you have both these running backs back there and what Baker Mayfield is, isn't a great quarterback. Uh, I just don't see them throwing the ball too much the rest of the season. Yeah. And their, and their schedule is like pretty, pretty conducive for running. So mm-hmm. it's just going to be, I actually made a trade. I gave up Nick Chubb and her, I gave up Nick Chubb and a 2021 first in a, in a super flex league for Lamar Jackson. Cause my only quarterbacks were Matt Ryan and Tom Brady and Matt Ryan has a fucking brutal, brutal playoff schedule. So it hurt to give him up, mm-hmm. uh, but I had to make the move. So trying to contend still. Yeah. And, I just acquired him in one of my leagues. I gave up JT a first and Jimmy Garoppolo. I got Derek Carr, Nick Chubb in a second. Love that. Love that move. JT fucking stinks. I'm, I'm joking. JT doesn't stink. We, we still like him. We'll talk about him a little bit. Oh, but, who's we, know. Mike? I'm off this train now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still on the train. I'm still on the train. But, you know, speaking of Baker Mayfield, who stinks, that's a great segue into one of the greatest trades ever made by yours truly at FB God. He gave up <laughs> Baker Mayfield for Kyler Murray before Kyler Murray played. Hey, Kyler Murray, a second, two-thirds, and two-fourths. Yeah. Yeah, back when Baker yeah. Mayfield was a first-round startup pick, I laughed at him. I was so wrong because he saw what none of us saw, which Kyler Murray is incredible. We're going to jump to that game because, because the Browns-Texans game stunk so bad. we got to talk about something good. And this game was a fireworks from start. Actually, maybe not from start, but, but like from the second half onwards. They were just going back and forth. Josh Allen looking like MVP Josh Allen for the first half and then reverting back to classic – Josh Allen for the second half of the game, throwing two picks. Um, he also even had a receiving touchdown as well. So that was interesting for his stat line. I mean, I guess on this game, I mean, Diggs, again, cementing himself as a top five dynasty wide receiver here. I have a question for you, touching. Mike. Stephon Diggs or Keenan Allen in the dynasty? I think they're one or two years apart. And I yeah. think the quarterback situation for Stephon both, it just Diggs. looks like both are clear cut alphas. Yeah, yeah. Stephon Diggs for me. Stephon Diggs for me mainly because I think Diggs has a higher touchdown upside and he's always been like a great contested catch guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Buffalo is clearly just, they've abandoned the run because they see what they have and they, they don't have a good defense. So they got to put it on Josh Allen's arms and Stephon Diggs' hands. But it's close, man. It's, it's really close. I, I, love, I really love both players. I talked about Keenan Allen being a contending team by uh, because he's constantly disrespected. But yeah, I think I, think I would rather, rather have Stephon Diggs. Yeah, I think I have them. I think I have Diggs like, 10 or 11 I think I have Keenan 15 or 16 just because of the age discrepancy and maybe they do add a receiver in this draft because it's a super deep class and Mike Williams isn't coming back next year so maybe they do mm-hmm. add a guy in the second or third round which could hurt Keenan Allen's upside but you said it like Keenan Allen is great we'll get to that game later which I don't want to talk about but we'll eventually talk about but yeah Stefan Diggs is an animal on the other side of the ball it's been weird with DeAndre Hopkins because he started off so hot and oh, then he's yeah. been wishy-washy but I, I don't know that that Hail Mary which wasn't even a Hail Mary because it was just like on a line dime. It was a dime. Just, it was a dude, dime. I saw somebody post it. It's like, this is a Jordan commercial because he was the only one whose hands were on the ball and he was wearing Jordan gloves. Like, there's no better endorsement than that. He's about to get a bag out of Michael. So I just, the game was incredible. Kyler Murray is incredible. And I was telling Mike before we are recording, Kyler Murray and Deshaun Watson, who we just covered that game, they're weird to me because I'll watch a game and through like two quarters, I'll be like, wow, these guys stink. What are they doing? And then the last two quarters, I'm like, okay, he's probably an MVP. These guys are incredible. They make crazy throws. They're great on the run. And Kyler Murray at this point might just be like the best read option quarterback I've ever seen. And it's so predictable, at least to me, because you can just put two linebackers on him. Because even if you do that and he gives it to Kenyon Drake, Kenyon Drake's getting three yards and falling down. Kyler Murray is taking every read option and going for six. I think he's up to like nine or 10 rushing touchdowns. Yep. He is, he's unreal. He's, he's about to go for 1,000 rushing, 4,000 passing with like double digit uh, rushing touchdowns. It's, 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 it's insane what he's doing. Like he took like what Lamar Jackson did last year. We thought that was not going to get repeated again. And it didn't get repeated by Lamar Jackson, but Kyler Murray is doing that and, and more and more. Um, is this going to be the third year in a row that a second year quarterback wins MVP? Was it Mahomes, Lamar, and maybe Kyler this year? Yeah. And yeah, then Herbert I mean, a lock next year. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Herbert's a lock. I mean, we can we can talk about that later. But I mean, yo, you you kind of disrespected Kenyon Drake, but Kenyon Drake actually had a pretty damn good game. He went 16 for 100 yards, averaged 6.2 yards per carry, which is actually higher than Kyler for the first time all year, I think. Uh, so, but he's not getting touchdowns. I mean, that's 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 the problem. He's not getting touchdowns. He's not getting targets. The first. The first and second down back in this offense is just not going to produce for you because Kyler Murray is just doing ungodly things. And if you have Kyler Murray, just ride him, ride him, start him everywhere. I mean, he's had what, like one week below, like below, like 15 points all year. It's, no, it's I think insane. he's been a QB one every single week. I saw somebody tweet. I think his worst game was like 24 and he was the QB 11 or 12 that week. 
Really? I thought he had, I thought he had like one week where he wasn't like at 20 points. It might depend on scoring. It was against Detroit. I remember that. It was like, I think he put up like even 24 points. It was something. Oh, like okay. That. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he's just been a total fucking cheat code. Um, Christian Kirk continues to get some love. He didn't go off again, but he still got four targets. Uh, so look, I mean, this is a, this is a good offense to be a part of, uh, but you basically want Kyler and you want the pass pass catching back people and the guys are not going to be giving you too much but incredible to watch great game fantasy gold mine uh but we're going to go straight from that into a colts versus tennessee titans game speaking of stinking jonathan taylor continues to freaking stink i mean i just i don't know what is going on here with him i think uh, i think like, i deciphered it i think twitter deciphered it too this colts backfield is a complete hot hand approach the issue is jonathan taylor has cold, dead hands. Like, he never has a hot hand. <laughs> Jordan Wilkins can get hot. They'll feed him. Naheem Hines, we saw yeah. it this week. We saw it two weeks prior. He got hot. They yeah. fed him. Jonathan Taylor, the only week where he's looked good, other than the Minnesota game, which I went back, he had 18 carries in the first half. He hasn't had 18 carries in a game since. Other than that game was against, I think it was Baltimore, right? And he had that long run and he fumbled, and then they just yep. put him on the bench. He's had, like, realistically two games where he's looked semi-competent. It's it's just really concerning because we thought with his schedule he'd be good. The Titans aren't world beaters, uh, run defensive they wise. Stink. We saw yeah we saw Naheem Hines go crazy against them, and he couldn't find any room to run against them. I don't know. I think this rookie year is just it, it's a lost season yeah. for him. Maybe in the offseason buy low on him, but I'm start. I don't know. I'm just starting to get a little concerned. But it, the it, one the silver lining is like his vision was so good in college. He was so good between the tackles in college. I don't know how you just lose that. Yeah, that that that's the one thing that gives me hope is like. You know, it's not like he had no vision in college. It, it just it seems like he put on the blinders when he got the NFL, and maybe his maybe his confidence is a little shot too now because you know he's a highly touted prospect and just came in didn't do anything. But he has not looked good at all. Uh, so, but I will say, like I mean, twenty one year old running backs. I mean, we don't want to give up on him too early because we saw it happen with like. You know, we saw it happen with Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon was awful, awful in his first year, and then kind of like started working into that. Yeah, still awful. He had like one good year, but yeah, I, I yeah, get yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, he's I mean, for fantasy to perspective, really yeah, I don't think you give up on him. But like the days of paying three first for him are gone. So that 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 you can kiss that goodbye. The days of people celebrating trading Saquon Barkley for him are are long gone. I don't know who people that did that, but if you did, my condolences. Um, but yeah, there's it, it's definitely looking a little bit grim. But on the on the positive side, Michael Pittman Jr. came out here and balled out seven catches 101 yards uh, I guess he's you know finally healthy so it's good to see him I mean this entire receiver class everybody even the guys I didn't like are doing good the entire class is doing good um, so I guess it's good from that perspective but on the flip side on the flip side of the ball did not look good did not look good for anyone at all I mean part of the team that that went scored 55 points at AJ Brown and DK Metcalf both starting AJ Brown one catch 21 yards DK Metcalf like two or three Man, catches, both like, of them dropped like would be 50 60 yard touchdowns in that game yeah. I know Metcalf is like a little bit out of his reach AJ yeah. Brown should have easily had one yeah he should have easily had one but he didn't so he totally boned us but Derrick Henry man he, he, did, he did pretty good man he did really good against a very very stout Indianapolis Colts offense despite being in a pretty poor ga- game script I mean Derrick Henry talked about him a little bit I talked about him on the contenders uh contender by uh, on my mark watch mondays but his playoff schedule is going to be league winning i mean he gets mm-hmm. freaking jacksonville detroit and green bay packers like that is the nuts uh in terms of running back so if you can get him go grab him man one thing i would balling. say too is if you look at his snap share it is like around 50 to 55 percent but you have to realize despite this he's seeing upwards of 20 carries a game he's getting the goal line work i know De- deonta foreman who i thought was like out of the league for good <laughs> yeah. a goal line touchdown he was like I think he was lined up at fullback and Henry was behind him. They faked it. They threw it to him. He's, as Mike said, he has too good of a schedule. He's too talented of a player. And of course, these past few weeks, he hasn't looked good, but he played Chicago and the Colts, who are two of the better run defenses in the league. Mm -hmm. Dalvin Cook is on right now, and he's not doing anything against the Chicago defense. I know he's about to run for 200 yards and five touchdowns because I said that. But (laughs) uh, it's, it's been tough. It's been tough for Derrick Henry these past few weeks, but don't don't sell him if your trade window is still if your trade deadline hasn't passed yet in dynasty if you have him write him out and i think mike you put him up in your market watch monday if you're a contender go buy him which i agree with because people that aren't contending probably want to sell him off because he's a little bit older but he doesn't get hurt and he's been very productive for the past two years yeah he's been great if if you're a contender just go buy him and ride him in the sunset don't worry about selling later on you know get the two three years however much you can get out of him and just just take those w's baby uh next up this game, you know, a couple teams that really stink, but there was definitely some bright spots. Washington football team versus Detroit Lions. Antonio Gibson, the god, continues to ball. You absolutely love to see it. Terry McLaurin cementing himself as a top 12 dynasty wide receiver yet again, despite playing with sub uh, suboptimal circumstances. But I guess, you know, a true 
I will call it a good comeback story. Alex Smith, man, passed for 390 yards. This dude had a bajillion surgeries on his freaking leg, which looked like, I don't know, man, looked like, I don't know if you guys saw pictures uh, of him doing surgery, but it looked like some like burnt backyard barbecue. It was terrible. And they it zoomed was... in on his leg during the game, like with the sock over it. His leg is like a legit rectangle. Like there's yeah. no definition, which it, like I think he had a brace on, but either way, like his leg is messed up. He went out there and he put up a career high for, I think, completions, attempts, and yards. I know the Lions defense, like anybody can really do that, but it was promising to see him out there. As you said, Terry McLaurin, I think Michael Thomas has to give up his Twitter handle because Terry McLaurin is the guy that nobody <laughs> yeah. can guard. Like he was turning Des- Desmond Trufant around every single route. He is incredible. If he ever gets a quarterback, if the Redskins ever are lucky enough or smart enough to trade up to number two and get Justin Fields, Terry McLaurin might be, this might sound crazy, like the dynasty wide receiver one. Like he is Wheels so up. talented. He is, he's ridiculous. And he's done it with Dwayne Haskins. He's done it with Alex Smith. He's done it with, who did they have last year? Colt McCoy, Case Keenum. Mm-hmm. I, I was about to say Josh Rosen. That's just like the elk of players that he's been surrounded around. If he has yeah. any sort of talent, he's going to be at least top five dynasty wide receiver. Yep, definitely. On the flip side of the ball, finally, they unleashed the talent known to all of us as DeAndre Swift. I had some back and forth with our homie Tw- uh, Ray GQ on, on Twitter, and it's tilting, right? Because I had DeAndre Swift as well as my RB1 for like forever, and then ended up flipping the JT because I just like really loved what JT saw. And I just wish, I just wish, if the Chiefs just solved all their problems and just drafted fucking DeAndre Swift and said to Clyde over he we, we would have been an easy swap, right? back. He would have been moved right back into our 101. Wouldn't have had any questions about who the RB1 was, but no, no. They had to take Clyde over and they had to fucking let – Matt Patricia and the shitty ass Lions take DeAndre Swift and make us wait, wait, wait until until week ten to get to see him get unleashed. But I mean, he looked incredible. He he was looked really good the entire year. But finally, with the full workload, like he looks like the stud that you know we had all hoped that he would be. Hindsight is twenty twenty, Mike. But do you think if the Lions never picked Carryon Johnson and us seeing what they did to him, if we if that had never happened, would you have moved uh, DeAndre Swift down your rankings? No. That's no, what okay. I feel like. I just feel like now at this point, we know Karrion Johnson isn't really that good of a running back, and that's probably why he got the type of workload or lack thereof that he did. DeAndre Swift, I moved him up my rankings. He is my dynasty RB1 of this class, and I think he might be my RB8 or 9, just because I know it's like crazy to be this reactionary, but the coaches went out and told us that he was going to start, and usually the coaches that do that will put like their third string in there, and he'll go crazy and run. <laughs> but what happened was he went out there, and he produced, and he produced like an absolute bell cow, an absolute workhorse. I think he went like six for 58 through the air. I'm not yep. sure how many rushing yards he had, but it was like close to a, a million. One. Yeah, close to a million. I was right. Um, and he's <laughs> honestly, it's high praise, but he reminds me a whole lot of Dalvin Cook. He's got power. He's got elusiveness. He's got yeah. speed. He has hands. He's, he's incredible. He's done everything that Jonathan Taylor hasn't. And he, he moved ahead of Clyde edwards helaire for me because I believe that this year he's going to be a top 12 running back going forward, just given their schedule, given his talent, and given the fact that they are using him a ton. And going forward, Karen Johnson doesn't have much longer on this team. Adrian Peterson probably has like 10 years left in the tank. I'm not sure if it's going to be with Detroit, but he's, he's awesome. And I'm not afraid to be reactionary because, as Mike said, he was my RB1 as well before Jonathan Taylor's landing spot. And I moved Clyde edwards helaire to the number one. That obviously didn't work out too well, but – um, everything he's shown to this point, and especially this past week, he cemented himself for me as the RB one in this class. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still kind of flirting with that. I'm trying to, trying to decide, but he's definitely jumped into the tier one for me uh, with all the guys. I still kind of really like to see what, what we'll get with Dobbins. But I mean, for for redraft purposes, if you got DeAndre Swift, like it's looking like he might be that Miles Sanders esque type rise. I, I just really, really hope that they don't like flip back and forth on this again. Mm-hmm. You just you just never know with Matt Patricia, um, but yeah, like it's wheels up, it's wheels up for DeAndre Swift. And I think the other the other bright spot from this game is you know we know Kenny G is out, and I thought Marvin Jones was freaking dead. I thought he was like washed already, uh, but he's had three straight weeks of double digit PPR points. This week he had ten targets, eight receptions, uh, ninety six yards, and a touchdown. So you know he's he's kind of given us that value flex play that we had hoped for in the off season. So just a small window of of hope there for him and the Detroit Lions. They end up pulling up the W. Um, but yeah, let's move on. I'm, I'm going to totally skip the Eagles Giants game because everyone in that game fucking stinks. Other than uh, Miles Carson. Sanders, and apparently Wayne Goldman's the RB three over the past month, but they're on by, and I'm not sure what's yeah. going on there. I don't, I'm not buying into him. I'm not picking him up on waivers just because I feel like even Alfred Morris is getting run, and when Devonta yeah. Freeman eventually becomes healthy, I don't know. It's just not a good enough offense. Their defenses look really good recently, but their yep. offense isn't good enough for me to buy into a 40 yard and like three touchdown performance out of Wayne Goldman. Yeah, Miles Sanders. 
Miles Stud. Sanders and DeAndre Swift for me, I feel like Stud. are very similar in terms of dynasty price and dynasty value because we know they're talented. They can catch passes. They're really good running the ball. It's just the coaching staff. We don't like obviously Definitely. Miles Sanders has seen a whole lot of work recently, which is good to see. But two touchdowns were scored by running backs this past week. One was Corey Clement on his only only snap of the game. The other was like a 50-yard run by Boston Scott. So um, the touchdown upside is still a little bit shaky, but I think as this team starts to build the offensive line, I know it's tough because they're older, but for as long as I've seen the Eagles, they've had a good offensive line. I think they prioritize that. Um, Miles Sanders is extremely talented, and he's producing despite a bad offensive line. So yep. for me, those two are super close. Yeah, definitely a stud. Uh, Jalen Rager, you know, took over as a target leader. He's definitely not there on efficiency if you look at his like actual production there uh, but you know the hope is that when you're early on you're looking for targets looking for opportunity and then he will prove later on that he can definitely live up to the hype so that's the only other bright spot there let's move on man to the bucks versus panthers tom brady the goat came back with an absolute fucking revenge tour uh stomped just just wally stomped this entire carolina panthers he just did whatever he wanted uh three touchdowns 341 yards plus a qb sneak on the goal line so, you know, bright spot there. I'm actually super happy. I have Tom Brady, one of my contending rosters, the one I just told you I traded for Lamar on. And I think it's looking like he's going to – I'm going to ride him to to the GOAT championship this year again. So, hopefully that rides out. But, man, man, I want to talk about this. Ronald Jones, man, he went off. He 98-yard touchdown. Uh, he looked – someone tried to tackle him. He just, like, broke away and, and showed that top end speed that Leonard Fournette does not have. Um, I mean, it's been – I think, to me, it's been clear Ronald Jones has been the best running back in that on that on that offense you know since the start of the year no questions the only tilting part is bruce arians just chooses to punish him whenever he makes a mistake luckily he didn't do it this game because ronald ronald Jones actually fumbled this game but bruce arians let him put him back in and he continued to ball out but that is the concern right that is a concern is that he doesn't get the receiving work because fournette is still kind of getting those looks um i don't know why because i don't fournette's not that really that good of a pass catcher anyways um but like i mean ronald jones man he went off for us too he, he helped us get yeah, he helped us big time. What I will say, and not to pat myself on the back, but we said it last week, right? Ronald Jones is a guy that you need to give the ball 20 or 25 times for him to get in rhythm. Mm-hmm. And Bruce Aarons putting him on the bench doesn't help him in any way get into rhythm. What happened this week? He fumbles early. I thought for sure he might have just gotten cut and, like, released right on the spot. <laughs> Despite that, he runs, I don't know how many times, but for, like, 190 yards. He looked incredible out there. And I think what he showed this week, not that it's – a facade not that it's like a mirage or what's the thing in an oasis in like the desert when you like see something that's right there is that a mirage? a mirage yeah um i just went through like an entire dictionary to find one word i said in the very <laughs> beginning but um I, it's bruce arians and i just not that i don't want to believe I, not that i don't want to believe in ronald jones or the talent because the talent's obviously there he's gotten much better each year that, that he's been in the league he's improved but all it takes is one fumble and he's it's back in the doghouse and i know it wasn't this week but they're playing the panthers run defense one of the worst units in the league It just concerns me if you have the opportunity to trade him in a redraft league and you can recoup a DeAndre Swift type of value, 100% go and do it. Any type of top 12 running back, go ahead and do it because Ronald Jones, we've seen this story before. He had three straight 100-yard games and he got put back in the doghouse once Leonard Fournette was back. It's just, it's too hard to predict week in, week out for me to have any sort of confidence for him for the rest of the season despite a good schedule. But you, you hit the nail on the head. Leonard Fournette, Guy stinks. We, we knew it. Leonard Fournette is nothing in this offense, despite being a part of this offense. And Tom Brady as well. He's almost like a locked in top five quarterback. That's probably a little bit too, too pricey. He's probably like a top seven or eight redraft quarterback the rest of the season because they do have an easy schedule. Antonio Brown is coming into his own. Mike Evans isn't just a goal line running back anymore. <laughs> and Chris Godwin has 10 healthy fingers now. So this yeah. offense is completely shit pumping anybody in their way. Uh, it was the Panthers. So you, you have to read a little bit into that, but um, on the other side of the ball, it looks like Teddy Bridgewater's knee is fucked up again. Philip Walker, who played college uh, football with Robbie Anderson and was coached by Matt Rule, may be in the fold. So expect like 35 targets for like seven catches and 42 yards for Robbie Anderson next week. Uh, Mike Davis apparently hurt his thumb but came back. Yep. So we'll see what happens. They play the Lions next week, which should be a decent bounce back spot for Mike Davis, who hasn't produced at all recently. Um, yep. But overall, this Panthers team, they're just – they're weird. They just, I don't know. I don't know anything about them. DJ Moore was used as like the fifth option. Now he's the number one option. It's just a <laughs> shuffling of the cards, shuffling of the deck every single week. Yeah, it's just, it's uh, not what you want to see at the wide receiver 
position. Ted, they're saying like they're hoping Teddy Bridgewater can practice this week. I don't, I don't see how that happens, but if they do, then they're rushing him back. So that's probably bad for his long-term prospects. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a carousel over here at this offense. So you don't want to, you don't want to lock yourself into like any team really. But someone I do want to lock myself into, James Robinson, the God, going against Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. Actually, kept it like a pretty close game. The only thing that was stopping James Robinson this game was the goddamn refs. Uh, two touchdowns called back. Uh, the one touchdown that he had was like from 15 yards out. He like carried two guys into the end zone and it got called back for a holding on the other fucking side of the ball, which was just <laughs> so tilting. Nothing. There's no greater buzzkill in life than fucking holding penalties. Like that shit is the worst. And you can tell I, right away because like everybody in the O line is dejected while the running back is celebrating. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. right back. It, it's, it's the worst. But he had 23 carries, 109 yards, 4.7 yards per carry. Uh, added on a couple targets. Good to see him get the target work again. Uh, you know, Dare Ogumba Wale stole a target, uh, stole a couple targets, but, uh, you know, it's good to see James Robinson continue to get involved in there. He is a workhorse. He is a stud. Uh, I know people are worried about him, you know, going forward because he might not get the job. From my perspective, it just makes no sense for them to spend deep draft capital on a running back. Uh, I think that he's done more than enough to show that he's capable. They have so many other holes to fill. They're probably in the sweepstakes for Justin Fields. So imagine this offense next year with Fields. J. Rob, DJ Chark, and Levis Chanel. I think it's I think it's wheels up for if it's offense, and I think he's going to be part of that future. Uh, and I think you got to get in now because if you wait and wait for people to fade, uh, wait for wait for them to like fade all the bullets in terms of like signing free agents or drafting running backs, you are not going to get James Robinson anymore. Uh, I just, I just don't think so, and I think he's worth the risk at his current cost um, to swing for the fences because he he looks incredible. He looks like, in my opinion, he has looked better than every single running back aside from DeAndre Swift last night. But even prior to last night, I think James Robinson was better than DeAndre Swift. The only thing he lacks is long speed, but we know how overrated that is um, in, in the NFL as long as you cross certain thresholds. So he looks incredible. So you're not worried about Jordan Howard possibly signing there as no. early as this week? <laughs> no. Who would you rather have in Dynasty, him or Antonio Gibson? I would rather have – I have them back-to-back, mm -hmm. and I have James Robinson – I think I, I keep flipping back and forth. I think I have Antonio Gibson ahead by one spot just because his job is a little bit safer. And I think Antonio Gibson is also quite incredible. Uh, but if, if I, if like, you know, I don't know, I basically switch back and forth like every day. Yeah. That's for like, me, I think closest. I have Gibson like 17 and Robinson 18, which might be a little bit lower than what you have them. For mm -hmm. me, what it is, is James Robinson is a workhorse this year. We haven't seen that out of Antonio Gibson. I feel like Antonio Gibson it's his first year playing like running back full time. And he's been very good. I think he's up to like six or seven rushing touchdowns. He's scoring basically like every week or every other week. Uh, he's getting the goal line work. I think as he starts to cement himself as the number one in this backfield, because I don't think JD McKissick is long for there. Like he's been decent, but he also catches like eight balls for like 22 yards. So the efficiency isn't there. Uh, I just think that when we finally see Antonio Gibson garner the workload that James Robinson is seeing right now, his upside is going to be higher because he does have that breakaway speed. He can catch passes out of the backfield as well. And he's looked pretty good on the ground, albeit like James Robinson has looked better. But um, I just think that the Washington football team situation might not be like better than the Jaguars because the Jaguars do have a sneaky good offensive line and they're in a better position to get a good quarterback this draft. But what he's shown me this year and the potential for him to be a workhorse, I would just, I, it's splitting hairs, but I just want to pose that question because I feel like those two are pretty close. And I think both of them are kind of getting undervalued in dynasty. Maybe not Antonio Gibson as much as James Robinson, but I think both are like locked in top 20 dynasty backs. Yeah, definitely. Um, on the other side of the ball, Devontae Adams, keeps scoring touchdowns. It's just, it's what he does. Marcus Valdez Scantling finally went off four for 149 and a touchdown. I think he had like an 80 yard touchdown from Aaron Rodgers. I'm not interested in Marcus Valdez Scantling. I don't, I just don't think he's that good, uh, period. And yeah, I just, I wouldn't really go to him on that one or read too much into that. But Aaron Jones had a pretty muted game actually against a pretty stinky defense. So that was a surprise. Um, I know part of it is just, you know, Devontae Adams splits with Aaron Jones is always pretty, um, I guess, pretty uh, clear in terms of like whenever Adams comes back, you know, Aaron Jones kind of like suffers a little bit on the fantasy side, both from a TD and from a receptions perspective. But I'm not really that concerned. He still has a really, really good playoff schedule. And I brought him up as well as a contending buy. 
uh, because he has also gets like the Detroit Lions. He also gets, I forget who it was, but like basically three golden, golden matchups. So I'm not worried about any of them. Are, are you worried about any of them uh, going No, forward? not at all. And you even said like Aaron Jones' numbers receiving wise go down when Devontae's there. I mean, despite this, the past few weeks, he's had six targets, five targets, five targets, five targets. He's had one game with less than five targets. He started off the year with six and eight, and he's on pace for 89. So I think the receiving work there is going to be consistent week to week. I know Jamal Williams got a whole lot of run last week, um, and he still saw six targets, five catches, 49 yards. He couldn't get much going on the ground. And, you know, my only concern about Aaron Jones, like he's looked good and he's fresh off an injury. My only concern is the goal line work just because it seems like Aaron Rodgers is just continuing his fuck you tour and just wants to throw for 50 touchdowns this year. And if that means goal line face to Devonte Adams or like Jay Sternberger or like no name guys on the number on the one yard line, it's going to happen. I know on Thursday night, he could have Aaron Jones could have potentially had like three touchdowns against San Francisco. Every time they were on the one, they threw the ball and every time was basically a touchdown. So um, it's, it's concerning because it hasn't happened, but it's also not concerning because they're consistently on that part of the field mm-hmm. and they have an extremely easy schedule. So I, I expect the touchdown upside to present itself where it really has in these past few weeks. Yep. Yep. Moving on to the pain town for our, our homie FD God here. Los Angeles Chargers against Miami Dolphins. Duel of the rookie quarterbacks. And Tua and his team come out on top because Tua has a lot more help than Justin Herbert does. But Justin Herbert, I mean, he saw it a decent game, 187 yards against a really tough, underrated Miami D. Two touchdowns on the ground and one touchdown uh, via a rushing on the goal line. I mean, that, that series is actually like, super tilting. I was watching. I tweeted this. But, like, you got freaking Justin Herbert, arm talent, Keenan Allen, incredibly talented wide receiver, Mike Williams, jump ball, choke slam specialist. And <laughs> they just run the ball three fucking times. Like, power ask you a question, Mike. What makes more sense? running an HB dive with Kalen Balage three straight plays or putting Justin Herbert in shotgun, putting Keenan Allen on one side, putting Mike Williams on the other, have one guy run a fade, have one guy run a slant. If they're not open, Herbert runs, then defense collapse and you throw it to him. That's what he did in the Hunter Henry touchdown. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's a dual threat quarterback. Use him as such. Don't you? Like Kalen Balage has been decent, right? But he's Kalen yeah. fucking Balage. You have Justin Herbert. Build this kid's confidence. Give him some play calls that he can build on in the future. Become a better quarterback. He's been incredible out there. He's on pace to shatter Cam Newton's touchdown record as a rookie. And you're using him as if he's a game manager. You're using him as if he's Tyrod fucking Taylor. <laughs> Let the kid grow. Let him throw. Let him dominate. And I know it's a tough defense, and it was a, a big loss. Like the score isn't as close as what the game was. They scored late, um, but I wasn't. I wasn't too hurt by this performance. I know that they were the, the chance of them going into Miami cross country field trip for the boys. Um, the chance of them beating them with this type of defense was very. Ex- it was extremely low, and the fact that they did kind of compete and the fact that Herbert didn't look rattled against this type of defense I think is it's super hopeful for his dynasty value I think I moved him up to my QB6 right now in dynasty I just what he can do on the ground and through the air and the weapons that they have being sort of young and hopefully adding a receiver through the draft in a deep class um, it it looks wheels up for him and this team is it's disappointing but for fantasy it's it's pretty nice yeah I think he's my QB5 Uh, I moved him up a few weeks ago and I have he's he's my highest exposure uh, NFL cards trading cards um, in terms of like I have like four or five Herbert auto uh, mosaic prisms which I'm gonna I was hoping to cash in when he wins rookie of the year but the only thing stopping him from winning rookie of the year is fucking Anthony Lynn and his retarded ass play calling so but do you think let like, let's say they don't win I know they play the Jets this week let's say they get one more win the rest of the season if he totals thirty let's say thirty five touchdowns which he's well on pace to do if he puts up thirty five touchdowns and like forty five hundred passing yards. Joe Burrow, like that team's not going to win a whole bunch of games. He puts up 4,030 touchdowns and two is doing what he's doing. Kind of a game manager, but still producing. I just don't see how they don't give him rookie of the year. Because to me, rookie of the year just means like most impressive rookie. Not like the team, yep. the rookie that led their team to a whole bunch of wins. Because if they did, they'd just choose an offensive lineman on a good team. Yeah, I mean, QB wins though, man. You never know what these idiots vote for. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's Justin Herbert. That's why I bought a lot of his cards. I think he is going to win rookie of the year, but... You know, you never know. If, if Tua comes out here, right, and he, he finished the season with, like, one loss, right, and his team goes to the playoffs, I could see them craft a narrative for giving it to him for sure. I think between Burrow and Herbert, though, it's, it's Herbert by, by a mile. So it's just, it just depends on how Tua does going forward and, you know, how much QB wins stats they quote going forward for the rookie of the year. Um, but speaking of Tua, 169 yards, two touchdowns, didn't really have to do that much. Team was in control. Their defense is, is really good. I mean, Salvin Ahmed – you know, the guy who ran a, I think went to the combine, ran like a four, eight, and we thought he was dead. <laughs> Fully revived himself. Uh, he went 21 carries, 85 yards. I think the key takeaway here, though, is whoever is in that Miami Dolphins 
backfield is going to be a workhorse. So I still think it's Miles uh, Miles Gaskin because that he was really good and he was also getting a lot of receiving work. But it, it, it's interesting to see, man. Man, these both these guys actually shared a backfield in college too. So you know they're kind of like reunited and duking it out again. And obviously Miles Gaskins won that job uh, the first time around. So hopefully when he's healthy again, hopefully for us BBB. Actually, no, we trade him away, so I actually won't care about him anymore. But hopefully for him. He's back to that workhorse role. Mike Kosicki continues to stink, as he always does. As I've said, as I've worn all offseason, despite all the hate mail that I've gotten from all you underwear uh, underwear Olympic truthers about how good he is and how he's going to be great in the Scott. He fucking stinks, man. Just just admit it. He the next Mike Kosicki is fucking Parham. People just post his, like, whatever, the bar, the bar charts. It's like, yeah, he's fast, <laughs> but he can't catch, which is your yeah. job. So I don't really yeah. care about that. What you said about Salvin Ahmed, I think he single-handedly influenced me to take up the debate about game speed and testing <laughs> speed because out there, yeah. there's no chance he runs like a four eight. He, that guy was blazing a yeah. four two every time he touched the rock. I know it was only like for four yards of carry, yeah. but he was fast as hell. Another guy that's fast as hell, uh, Jakeem Grant. We all know Jakeem it. Grant. That guy, Malcolm Perry. I don't yeah. know who he is. He's from Navy. He might be the fastest player I've ever seen. There was <laughs> one play. I think it was like a screen. He ran to the right and he went to the left. I blinked and he was gone. I'm like, I don't know who you are, but I need you to touch the ball more because you are fast as fuck. Yeah, yeah, that was that was an exciting one. I mean, Salvin Ahmed was so interesting because like leading up to the combine, everyone thought he's gonna run like a four three. My like comp four- for him was Matt Breida, and now he <laughs> yeah. took Matt Breida's job. <laughs> I mean, he must have pulled a hammy or something. That's the only way to explain how how slow he ran because definitely like on game on game speed, he looks a lot faster than than he tested. So interesting lookout. I mean, I think you guys should pick him off off waivers. Uh, I put in a bid for him on our BBB Dynasty League just to get a couple starts off him if we can. And just in case, you know, like who knows? Maybe he wins the job uh, from Miles Gaskin as well. And I'm pretty sure their uh, upcoming then, schedule, I know Miles Gaskin can't come back until week 12, and it might even yep. be longer than that depending on the severity of his injury. Their upcoming schedule, Denver, the Jets, Cincinnati. Denver, we're going to yep. talk about it. Is that the next game maybe? We can talk about that next Yeah, game. yeah. Well, Denver is I'm, – I'm not afraid to say it. I know we talked about it last week and somebody commented like, Oh, I'm glad you guys said Denver's defense was bad. Our top two corners were out. That just shows how little you know. Denver might be like <laughs> literally the worst defense I've ever seen. And I say that about every team every week. They're terrible. They give up four They're rushing so touchdowns, bad. two of which Devontae Booker, who I didn't even know so was bad. in the league until last week. So bad. They, they are they are freaking awful. Uh, Josh Jacobs went to town. Love to see that. Uh, he got some targets as well, which you mm-hmm. absolutely love to see. Um, but yeah, Josh Jacobs went ham. I mean, Drew Locke fucking stinks. We've said it all along. I, I forget who whoever comments like in all our videos in the summer. Like every time I talk about Drew Locke, you comment and saying like how I'm a Drew Locke hater. I'm not a Drew Locke hater, dude. It's just reality. He's not, he's not Do very people good. People don't realize he, he was like a second round pick. He wasn't picked to be – like maybe he was picked to be a franchise yeah. like quarterback. But in the second round – I mean, he, his longevity isn't there. I don't think he's going to start next year. He hasn't been good. And there was some stat about the Raiders not turning over anybody. It doesn't matter. Drew Locke will let you turn him over. It's, <laughs> dude, he's, he's a human bakery just pumping out turnovers. This guy is terrible. He's, he's so bad. But the one bright spot is this receiving core, this supporting cast, they have some players out there. I know Cortland Sutton wasn't oh, playing. Yeah. But even like Tim Patrick, an older guy, looks good. And then KJ Hamler, back-to-back 10 target weeks. Jerry Judy looks good out there. The running backs incredible. fucking stink. Noah Fant. Uh, whoever is the quarterback of this team, as long as their initials aren't DL next year, I mean, it, it might be wheels up, which is what we said for Drew Locke this year, but we knew he stunk. If they get anybody with talent, they're going to be surrounded with a lot more talent to help them produce. For sure, for sure. It's, it's, a, it's a talent, talent-rich offense, and they could absolutely ball out. I mean, if they add like a Zach Wilson, maybe if they pick high enough, it's definitely going to be wheels up for that team. Uh, next game, we don't want to cover it at all. I mean, Seattle Seahawks stinks. Russell Wilson had one of his worst games ever. The Rams defense looks pretty legit. Not much to talk about there other than the fact that Josh Reynolds is out targeting Robert Woods over these past few weeks, which is just inexplicable. Uh, and then obviously DK Metcalf put up a dud, but he almost had a, ha- almost had a long bomb. So mm-hmm. don't want to cover that one too much. But let's, well, how let's about um, Cam Akers actually led the team in rushes, but it's, it's a three-head it's monster. Not good. It's, it's ugly not. this year. He could have had a touchdown. He literally Charlie horsed his right guard. Like he was wide open. Yeah. He just <laughs> ran off tackle a little bit. Puts an elbow into him. The guy collapses. He collapses. Uh, Malcolm <laughs> Brown goes for two touchdowns. Daryl Henderson yeah. gets one. But Cam Akers did get the most work. He looked good out there. He looked fast. He looks a whole lot better than what he did to start the season. This yeah. year, I guess he's like worth a stash just in case one of these other two get hurt. But it's a committee this season. But- All right, Bengals, Steelers. Big Ben looking great. I mean, the Steelers team looks pretty damn good. Their offense looks super legit. I mean, they have three wide receiver ones, basically. Deontay Johnson, Juju Smith-Schuster, Chase Claypool. Each one with at least a touchdown. Claypool with two. Deontay Johnson went ham. 
He looks incredible. He's like, he's just a little bit inconsistent. You know, sometimes he looks really good. Sometimes he looks really bad. He'll like, he'll like have a couple of bad drops every game. Uh, the Steelers run game. I don't know what the hell's going on, but against a pretty shitty Bengals defense and what should have been a very positive game script. What was a positive game script? James Conner did absolutely nothing. They've turned into like the bills with a good defense. Like they just yeah, yeah, yeah. have to run. They just have so many good weapons. Like let's just throw it. Yeah. Big Ben has no kneecaps this week. Let's just keep throwing it. He'll throw four touchdowns against a bad defense and bad weather. Yep. And Mike, before we get to the other side of the ball, I have to say it. I'm sorry. T Higgins. <laughs> I'm sorry for everything I said about him. That, like it started as a joke. I remember we were doing a rookie mock draft and we had just gotten off of watching film and Nick and I both had the same take. We're like, Denzel Mims looks like a better version of T. Higgins. Not necessarily slandering T. Higgins, but just being like, hey, this Denzel Mims guy is him, but better. I was wrong. I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf of Nick. I don't speak on behalf of other men, but I'm going to speak on behalf of Nick. He was wrong too. T. Higgins <laughs> is fucking incredible. He's on pace for 1,000 yards, and I moved him into my top 15 dynasty receivers. This guy is legit, and I don't care that Tyler Boyd is there. Both of them can be top 20 dynasty receivers. This 1A, 1B combination between them, Joe Burrow is in literally and figuratively and whatever in good hands with this wide receiver core. He's, he's awesome. He's done against good defenses. He's done against bad defenses. Um, the only thing he lacks, same to James Robinson, is that breakaway speed, those yeah. long touchdowns. I believe this week he also had an opportunity to score long when he got caught up from behind. Yep. But it, it doesn't matter. He's A.J. Green reborn without like the overwhelming athleticism. He's, he's incredible. Yeah, he's not going to be a yak guy, but he's going to be exactly like AJ Green. I mean, I, when when he landed there, I'm like, dude, this guy is fitting that mold because he he's really good. He'll get downfield and he'll catch it uh, because he just like he mosses guys. He's incredible. He's got great hands. He's got the size. Look, T. T. Higgins is is back to back to back with uh, C. D. Lamb and uh, Justin Jefferson for me. I would not give up one for the other. He looks incredible as advertised. Joe Burrow did a little bit better than his first time around against this defense. Tyler Boyd, like you said, he's going to be. You know, he didn't have a great game this game. He, he actually always struggles against the Steelers uh, for some reason. They play this lot really well. But going forward, this is going to be a great defense. And if they add some talent on that O-line, it's going to be good. I think one thing we should talk about, though, Joe Burrow's arm strength. I mean, I see a lot of film grinders, like, really knocking him on that. And, you know, he, him not being able to, like, make the type of throws that need to be thrown in some cases. Like, did you, do you see that when you look at Joe Burrow at all? Is that a, is that a concern? Mike, I'll, I'll say this. If you want to come to me for quarterback evaluation, don't. Because I fucking hated Justin Herbert for as long as this offseason lasted. And I was completely wrong about that. So, honestly, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Joe Burrow's arm strength. Obviously, that was like the one knock about him other than like age coming out of college was his arm strength. I, I don't know. I don't know enough. I'm going to be honest. I don't know enough about the quarterback position or scouting them or whatever to be able to um, indict him on be, on that fact. I mean, we've seen Drew Brees and Tom Brady who aren't necessarily the biggest gunslingers in the league be MVP candidates and Super Bowl winners with bad arm strength. So uh, I'm not too sure how that's going to affect his fantasy value. I just see a really good quarterback out there with a good supporting cast. And that's, I'll just leave it at that. It's a cop out just because I don't want to speak out of turn really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I, th I think he's still going to be as advertised. He's, he's been playing pretty damn good. So I'm hopeful for him going forward. Uh, but that's enough about the Bengals Steelers rivalry. Uh, let's move on to the next game here. And next up we have, the ever exciting San Francisco 49ers, who stinks? Uh, Nick Mullins, freaking terrible, just awful. Their running game without Raheem Mostert is is abysmal. The only bright spot here is, I think, Brandon Ayuk. And I, I, and I know I was definitely wrong on him coming into the season. He was not someone I liked. I laughed at people thought he was better than Nikhil Harry. Clearly, he's better than Nikhil Harry. I'm, I'm already, <laughs> I've already moved past Nikhil Harry. Brandon Ayuk looks pretty damn good. He's a playmaker, and without Debo there, he looks like the wide receiver one. And I know we talked about this a little bit with Nick. I want to get your opinion on it as well. But with a healthy Debo, who do you prefer? Do you like Ayuk more or do you like Debo more? I think I have Debo. We, I think we talked about this last week too. I think I have Debo like two spots ahead of him, but it's becoming close. And I know like the whole air yards thing was like, oh, Debo's going to have negative six air yards this week. Yeah, he also turned that into like 95 yards. Debo or Brennan Ayuk is seeing the targets and the air yards with and without Debo Samuel in this offense. It's going to be consolidated target share either way between those two and George Kittle. Um, for me, I haven't moved Ayuk ahead of Debo Samuel just because we saw him. We saw Debo Samuel do basically the same thing last year with a healthy Kittle and with Emmanuel Sanders there as well. Um, yeah. I would have to see more of a sample size with both on the field and a healthy Kittle for me to iron that out. But at the same time, by the time that happens, people will eventually then know who the one A is and who the one B is. But I think you, you can't go wrong with either Kyle Shanahan is going to find the way to get the ball in either guy's hand. Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be gone next year. Hopefully they have a quarterback that can get the ball in either one of those guys' hands. They're electric after the catch, before the catch, whatever you want to call it. 
Um, and he's really impressed this year. I know he was somebody that I was decently high on the landing spot. I was like, eh. And then I think I ranked him as like my wide receiver eight going into the year. Um, I feel like he's stayed around that because other guys have moved up. Obviously other guys have moved down. Um, but he, he looks great. I think he's inside my top 35 dynasty receivers pretty easily. And th there's a whole bunch of talent there and an offense that wants to get him the ball. And it, it showed on draft capital and shown through his production thus far. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, he, he's been in a lone bright spot there, obviously, with Kittle gone. But it'll be interesting to see next year, like, with everyone healthy, how those, like, target shares shape out. And also with, like, Raheem Mostert back and with, like, Jimmy G back. Um, I guess moving to the other side of the ball, I mean, <laughs> I tweeted this out, and it's crazy because, like, only Alvin Kamara can do this. He had a rushing line of eight carries for 15 yards, and he put up 35 points because he had three touchdowns, six receptions, 83 yards to the air. Alvin Kamara is incredible. Uh, he's the Michael best Thomas. bad running back I've ever seen. Like he's not <laughs> a great running back, but he's a great running back. If that makes sense. Like he's yeah. not a ground and pound guy, but he'll get you 150 yards from scrimmage and four touchdowns any given week. He's so elusive between the tackles this year. He hasn't been great. I don't think he's top like 85 rushing yards, but it doesn't matter. Like he is, yeah. I think he's overtaken Michael Thomas at this point. This offense isn't the same thing it was last year. They're yeah. just feeding Alvin Kamara whether or not Michael Thomas is playing. Um, and he's incredible. As Mike said, he averaged like less than two yards of care and he still was the RB one on the week. So, um, Drew, obviously Drew gone, gets a little bit tougher, but you can't sell him off because of that. Yeah. Drew breezy has gone. So he's got fractured rib, punctured lung, uh, freaking gridiron. I mean, this is a savage game, man. Modern day gladiator. Uh, so he's gone. I don't know what that means for Alvin Kamara. It doesn't mean anything. Cause you're going to still start him every single week. Uh, I'm not sure what that means for Michael Thomas, but freaking Jabu, man, Jabu is in. All those Jameis Winston shares that I acquired this offseason is about to pay off because he's about to step on the field and throw five picks in his first opening game. Man, all those Jameis Winston shares that I wasn't able to sell off last year and have to have on my bench <laughs> was finally paying off. This is going to be the best O-line he's ever played with. Probably one of the best cores he's played with. He's got Alvin Kamara in the backfield. He's got Michael Thomas, who stunk that game. But, you know, Michael Thomas is Michael Thomas, so I'm not that concerned about him yet. I'm, in, I'm excited to see what this offense looks like with Jameis Winston. And, you know, he, when Drew Brees went out, I mean, Jameis Winston got the, got the move. Oh, to, to Taysom Hill's truth, there's shocking surprise, even though Taysom Hill gets paid one of the most grossly overpaid contracts in the NFL. He's not a quarterback, to, uh, contrary to popular belief. It is Jameis Winston. So I'm I will interested. say, though, um, the waiver's probably passed by this point because it comes out on Wednesday. But Taysom Hill is tight on eligibility. I know on ESPN and probably like Yahoo as well. Um, they said that they're going to probably change it if he does play primarily quarterback, which I don't see happening. But if you can pick him up as a tight end this week and he does score a touchdown, either throwing the ball or rushing the ball or whatever it may be, like he's going to be a tight end one this week without Drew Brees because they're going to find a way to get him the ball. And the yep. tight end position is so shallow that he's going to end up being a top 12 guy with like seven points. There you go. That's that next level of insight brought to you by Bunk Bed Breakdowns. To get him <laughs> in your tight end slot. So I'm excited to see what happens there. If you have Jameis Winston, if you're in a rebuild, though, I would, I would be dumping off the shares because – there's a, there's a pretty talented QB class coming in. So I'm not sure like where he's going to land going next year. So if you can cash out for like a second round pick, I would absolutely do that um, if you can. Okay, next up, the Ravens versus my Patriots. Patriots pulled out the W. Cam Newton, that's my quarterback. He is getting it done. I know I, I had to put up with all this bullshit about how people thought, you know, Nick Foles was better than Cam Newton. Get the fuck out of here, man. Nick Foles fucking stinks. I'm better than I'd Nick Foles. Have Cam Newton. That's saying a whole lot. Cam Nick Newton. Foles is terrible. Yeah, Cam Newton carries the ball freaking like eight, nine times every time. And if they get the goal line, you know they're going to give it to him. They're just going to give it to him because he's like a 95% conversion rate on third and fourth and short. So he is unstoppable. Uh, Jacoby, uh, Jacoby Myers, though, what do you think about him? I mean, this is the second week of a row where he's led. Obviously, he has a connection with, with uh, Cam Newton, and he put up a pretty respectable line against a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough uh, Baltimore Ravens defense. I love this guy. I put him in the um, the waiver article last week, which I guess I was like late to the party because he put up like 170 yards. But he wasn't even owned in 60% of leagues going to next week. Now, I think it's because people were nervous about him going up against Baltimore. It didn't matter. Obviously, he threw that the passing touchdown, which isn't going to happen week after week, although it was like a dot. And it's probably a throw, not to sound like an asshole, but I don't think Cam Newton could have made that throw. Like that was a beautiful throw. Absolute rainbow mm -hmm. dropped right in the bucket of Rex Burkhead, who is somehow fantasy relevant again. But Jacoby Myers, to me, um, might sound crazy. He's like a back-end wide receiver, too, the rest of the year. He's seen a 40% target share the past three weeks, which doesn't mean a whole lot because they don't throw the ball a lot. But you look at his schedule. They play the Texans up next. They play the Cardinals, who aren't great uh, guarding the slot. I know Patrick Peterson does travel into the, into the slot, but he got burned by Cole Beasley this week. Then they play the Chargers, the Rams. We'll see what Jalen Ramsey does. And they play the Dolphins, who are great in the slot, and then the Bills after that. So he's got a pretty easy schedule. 
He is the yeah. number one option in this passing game. I'm not sure if Edelman's even going to come back this year with his age and his knee injury. Um, Nikhil Harry, I'm not sure if he's ever going to play football again. He probably shouldn't. Uh, he's the only option in this passing game. He's looked good. He, he is sneakily, like, good after the catch. He has some decent moves. I'm not sure his yak numbers, but just watching him play, he looks like he can shake somebody after the catch. Um, that's just that eye test analysis, that animal analysis you only get on this channel. But he looks really good to me. And I, I think in Dynasty, he's somebody like Travis Fulgham who's just coming out of nowhere and producing. And maybe Travis Fulgham is a little more valuable than him because he has shown it on a bigger scale week after week. But um, he's somebody I'm extremely hopeful for. He looks talented out there, and I've, I see no reason for him to be replaced because all he's done since getting that starting job is produce. Yeah, I mean, he had a bit of hype, like, coming into, like, last year even. Uh, like, he, he had, like, some, some pretty good connection uh, with, with Brady on, I guess, on training camp. Uh, was I think the was preseason at. he did really well, too. He was, like, the best receiver. And people are like, oh, he's not better than Nikhil Harry. And turns out anybody's better than Nikhil Harry. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Turns out that Nikhil Harry stinks, so I was big wrong, big wrong on that. Um, but yeah, he's definitely worth a waiver I pick up. You know, I have him stashed in a couple of dynasty leagues as well, and I'm putting him in as a spot starter in super deep leagues. He's going to provide some value down the stretch. I mean, Damian Harris also looked pretty good, 22 carries, 121 yards. He's clearly locked up that, like, previously held like Garrett Blunt role, even though he didn't get any touchdowns this week. That all went to Cam and uh, Rex Burkhead with two receiving touchdowns. So, this is this is like the classic New England running back carousel. So you're not going to be able to trust any of them. The only running back you can trust is Cam Newton going forward. On the flip side, Lamar Jackson, RB1 for the Ravens, 11 carries, 55 yards, 240 yards to the air and two touchdowns and interception. Um, you know, it's kind of sad to see J.K. Dobbins still kind of like relegated back to, you know, the mix of the thing. He's probably not going to be a thing this year, you know, which is a big, Big blow to me because I thought he would be. I thought, you know, when Mark Daniel went down, they would absolutely give him the ball, but clearly that's not the case. So you, I, I, I don't think you can drop him because his upside is still pretty high if, if one of these guys get hurt, but you definitely can't really trust him week to week starting going forward. I mean, you know, I, I know you moved DeAndre Swift ahead of Jacob Dobbins. Is he your RB2 still, or did you move uh, anyone else ahead of him? Let me check right now. I think he might be – it's a cluster for me between JT, CEH, and Dobbins, so he might be my four – but to me, they're like pretty interchangeable. Yeah, they're right next to each other. Um, actually, he's a little bit lower. Just I don't know. I just I think going forward next year, he's gonna move his way well into the top ten. Just because I feel like Mark Ingram doesn't have much longer in this league. Who knows though? Um, Gus Edwards as well. I feel like they got him on a pretty cheap deal. I'm not sure if they're gonna be able to keep him. I know he was like an ERFA this off season. Um, but we've obviously seen the talent. We see how good he is. Jonathan Taylor is disappointing. Kyra Hilaire is disappointing. But um, for this year, he's not a drop candidate for me just because we've seen the upside and we've seen Mark Ingram already go down with an injury. But this game was just a mirror image of each other in terms of backfield usage. Like, these guys look good. But you never know week to week who's going to start. Like, Damian Harris looked incredible. Despite that, the week prior, uh, Rex Burkett was the one that got the goal line work. This week, he got two receiving touchdowns. It's like you never really know what you're going to get. The ceiling for a guy like Damian Harris is like 100 yards and a touchdown on a weekly basis. Um, and then the Ravens side of the ball, it's – it's really sad. Like Marquise Brown tweeted out, what's the point of having soldiers when you're never going to use them? Turns out he's like not even a soldier because he, <laughs> he like doesn't get open. He probably does get open, but they just don't look at him. Willie Sneed is, has been better than him as of recently. Um, Mark Andrews had like one of his best games in weeks, which was like 60 yards. It's, it's a mess. And see. Lamar Jackson, I think he's moved down to my quarterback. Let's see. Live reaction quarterback eight in Dynasty. Who do you have ahead of him? I have Mahomes, Kyler, Deshaun Watson. Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, Herbert, Josh Allen, Lamar. Interesting. Yeah, I don't. Have, I don't have Dak ahead of him yet, just because Dak's hurt. But if Dak was Dak was like healthy, then for sure I would probably move him as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of you know it's it's kind of sad to see. And I think a big part of it though is that freaking offense and like how how like stagnant it's been. Right, it hasn't really moved at all um, compared to like Greg Greg Roman. This is like this is basically freaking. Um, what do you call it? Uh, Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick all over again. Like he just he didn't change his offense at all. And you know Lamar Jackson quoted and saying like, "Hey, defenses are basically calling out our plays at the line of scrimmage, and that's not good news." So, I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's brutal. It's something that you don't want to see, but it's happening. So it is what it is. Um, let's I think see. That's that, it for games. Yeah, I it. mean, this Monday night game is going on right now, and somehow I've been watching Justin Jefferson's up to seven for one twenty one, and I've seen Adam Thielen drop a few passes. Justin Jefferson's incredible. The Chicago oh, defense sure, yeah. is good. Do it doesn't Dalvin matter. Cook's down. Dalvin Cook's down. Oh, I just saw that. He's holding his stomach. What happened? I don't know. They got a Dalvin whole bunch Cook's of people out down. there. 
Oh, this guy's hurt on defense too. A live injury reaction that will be outdated by the time this video comes out. Let's see. Uh, he just like punched himself in the stomach or something. Oh, he fumbled. Oh, he might have gotten the wind knocked out of him because the ball came. Oh, out of his stomach. Uh, it looks like it looks like the ball like nutted him, hit him in the yeah, nose. Yeah, that's okay. So Dalvin might be okay, but this game is this game's a fucking shit show. It's thirteen thirteen right now with fourteen thirty eight. In the fourth, there's not much to talk about. I mean, Justin Jefferson's an absolute animal. He's going to be the wide receiver one next year. Allen Robinson needs to be freed. And Darnell Mooney, I haven't seen this guy get covered at all this season. And it doesn't matter because the best coverage on Darnell Mooney has been Nick Foles because he can't get on the ball. He is always open. Um, he's Taylor Gabriel reincarnated, but good. And it doesn't matter because his quarterback play is absolutely atrocious. All right, well, that's all we got for you guys this week. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you enjoyed, hit the thumbs up, smash the subscribe button. Follow me, follow Noah. Follow Nick. Hopefully he's still alive. Um, and, uh, you know, engage with us on Twitter and, you know, shoot the shit. And we'll always, we'll always be there. Hit us up in the comments as well. We try and get back to you guys as much as we can uh, on the channel. And make sure you tune in for Discord discussions with Noah. That's been super cool. He's been chatting with uh, all the all the fellow Bunk Bed Breakdown fans at BDG, Big Dogs out there. So that's been a great segment to watch. Um, and, you know, just get one-to-one -one time with uh, with the God himself who called – Kyler over break Baker when everyone else is on. Yeah, the my only call that's been right in these past two years. It worked out for me. Got it. Okay. Cool. That's all we got. Peace. Peace.